I'm making this video to talk about Daniel chapter 8, a prophetic scripture in the Old Testament which Christians should be paying attention to and the reason why they should pay attention to Daniel chapter 8 is because in this chapter the constant feature of the daily sacrifice is mentioned which is taking away and the established place of his sanctuary thrown down. Now this constant feature is mentioned by Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24 we hear some very important words from Jesus Christ regarding Daniel. And here it says in verse 15, Therefore, when you catch sight of the disgusting thing that causes desolation, as spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in a holy place, let the reader use discernment. So in this scripture, Jesus Christ is asking his audience to very carefully discern what Daniel the prophet is saying. And this is in regards to a disgusting thing that causes desolation. Now that the, the disgusting thing that causes desolation uh, mentioned by Jesus Christ is also connected to the constant feature or the daily sacrifice in Daniel chapter 11. And if we go down to verse 20, 29 to 31, we'll see that it, it connects the disgusting thing to the removal of this constant feature. It says here, and remove the constant feature after profaning the sanctuary, the temple of God, and they'll put in place the disgusting thing that is causing desolation. This is what Jesus Christ brings our attention to. However, the first instance of this removal of the constant feature is in Daniel chapter 8. And so this is a very good place to start if we want to discern what Jesus Christ asks us to discern. So if we can see this connection between the disgusting thing that is causing desolation mentioned by Jesus Christ and the removal of the constant feature, then it should be in a Christian's best interest to understand what Daniel saw in chapter 8 because that is where the, this constant feature is first mentioned. So if we go back to Daniel chapter 8 we'll see that what Daniel saw was given to him in a vision. Now in Daniel chapter 8 let's scroll down to where the constant feature is mentioned in verse 11. And notice, however, that it says, and all the way to the prince of the army, who's the prince of the army? Jesus Christ. It put on great airs, and from him, from Jesus Christ, the constant feature was taken away. And the established place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Now, I'd like to ask my audience to very carefully think about this verse. If the prince of the army is Jesus Christ, and the established place of his sanctuary was thrown down, then what sanctuary or temple is it talking about here? Is it talking about the first century brick-and-mortar temple in Jerusalem? that was indeed thrown down? Or 
Is it talking about the temple that Jesus Christ established and inaugurated through his death, through his crucifixion and resurrection? A very important thing for a Christian to think about. If this is the Christian temple or sanctuary which was thrown down, then it has great significance for every Christian. Notice also that it says, from him, the constant feature was taken away. So what constant feature or daily sacrifice is attributed to him, to Jesus Christ? This discussion I will leave for a future video because it's probably one of the most significant things that a Christian needs to understand. And I will dedicate an entire video to that discussion. So if you're watching this video, I'm going to assume that you've already read Daniel chapter 8 and have some of your own convictions about it, what it means, or perhaps someone else has taught you what they think Daniel chapter 8 means. And so I will just point out the main features of this vision that Daniel had, and also the interpretation that the angel gave to Daniel. And so here we go. What Daniel saw in his vision was a ram standing before a water course. It had two horns, which were both tall, but one was taller than the other. And the taller one came up afterward. Now also, this ram had no other wild beast standing before it, and there was no one doing any delivering out of its hand, and it did according to its will, and it put on great airs. So this ram had enormous amounts of power and had no enemies or had no one who could contend with it. However, the next part of the vision, it mentions a male of the goats who did indeed contend eventually with this ram. And as regards this he-goat, there was one conspicuous horn between its eyes. And it came at the ram in a powerful rage. It came in contact with the ram, showing bitterness towards it, and eventually proceeded to strike down this ram and break its two horns, and there proved no power in the ram to stand before it. And so this ram no longer had uh, power over the entire earth. It now had to deal with the he-goat. And now that this male of the goats also put on airs to an extreme, but when it became mighty, that one great horn was broken, and there proceeded to come up four conspicuous horns instead of it. Later on, out of one of those four conspicuous horns, there came to be another horn, a small one, that eventually became very much greater. And this is the small horn that goes all the way to the Prince of the Army, Jesus Christ, removes the constant feature, and throws down the sanctuary that Jesus Christ established. Now, in regard to this vision, uh, holy ones, including the angel Gabriel, help Daniel to have some understanding about what it me means. And so, one of the things that is asked is, how long will the vision be of the constant feature and of the transgression causing desolation? to make both the holy place, the temple, and the army things to trample on. 
And so that time is given. And that eventually, the holy place will certainly be brought into its right condition. Then also notice that the angel Gabriel steps in and that he helps Daniel understand that the vision is for the time of the end. And so if we believe we are living in this time, then it's very important that we understand what Daniel saw. He also told Daniel, here I am causing you to know what will occur in the final part of the denunciation because it is for the appointed time of the end. So the time we are living in now. So please understand that if we are living in the appointed time of the end, and that is now, then the temples, the holy places mentioned, are not the brick and mortar temple in Jerusalem, but the Christian temple that Jesus Christ inaugurated with his crucifixion and resurrection. And the prevalent conviction and popular conviction is that the holy place being spoken of here was the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed in the first century. Now Gabriel interprets the vision for Daniel and tells him what the ram and the horns stand for. So Gabriel tells Daniel that the ram that you saw possessing the two horns stands for the kings of Media and Persia. And the hairy he-goat stands for the king of Greece. And as for the horn that was between its eyes, it stands for the first king. And that one having been broken, so that there were four that finally stood up instead of it. And there are four kingdoms from his nation that will stand up, but not with his power. And then he goes on to say, in the final part of their king kingdom, as the transgressors act to a completion, there will stand up a king fierce in countenance and understanding ambiguous sayings. And so it's my belief this king fierce in countenance represents that small horn that grew out of one of the four other horns, conspicuous horns. And this is the one that will remove the constant feature and put in place the disgusting thing. And now, this is a very important part that uh, Gabriel told Daniel in regard to the timing of the constant feature being removed. He merely says that it's true. And you, for your part, keep secret the vision because it is yet for many days. Now, the popular conviction of most Christians is that these kings of Media and Persia are Darius, the king of Media, and Cyrus, the king of Persia, who did indeed uh, uh, take over the city of Babylon. And also that this king of Greece would be the most famous king, Alexander the Great of Greece, who can, we can read about in the history books, and that these four that finally stood up instead of it were the four generals that took over his kingdom after Alexander the Great died. And after that, we really don't get any very good clues with which we can identify the king of fearsome countenance. And so if we contemplate the historical history book significance of that Christian interpretation, then it becomes very difficult to understand. And Daniel himself admits that there was nobody understanding it at that time. However, now, in several thousand years later, 
we can indeed look in the history books and see that there was a human king of Media and Persia and also a king of Greece and there were indeed four generals who took over after Alexander the Great died. But I'd like to ask every Christian to contemplate this. Why would this very important vision given to Daniel simply be a history lesson? A, in fact, a very mundane history lesson. So if my audience agrees that this is simply just a history lesson recorded in a vision, then what spectacular revelation does it give us? Other than thinking that, wow, isn't that great? The angel foretold that there would be kings of media and Alexander the Great and four generals that... Uh, replaced him after his death. In fact, knowing that is quite mundane. In fact, it's pretty boring. And if we consider that Jesus Christ wanted us to look at what Daniel told us about the constant feature and the disgusting thing, then of what significance is understanding that there be kings of Media and of Greece that we can stand back and be amazed about in regards to history. There's nothing. And so, are these kings of media and Persia really talking about the human pagan King Darius and King Cyrus and the pagan King Alexander the Great? Now, I'd also like to ask my audience to consider that this has been a Christian conviction for thousands of years. Uh, we've known about Alexander the Great and the four generals. And yet, if we go to Daniel chapter 12, we'll find out that the understanding of Daniel would not occur until the time of the end. And here in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel himself is told that. Make secret the words and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will rove about and the true knowledge will become abundant. And so consider that for thousands of years, this interpretation of Daniel's dream has been pointed to Alexander the Great and uh, Darius and Cyrus. So if this vision is only going to be understood at the time of the end, then perhaps those preconceived convictions that have been around for thousands of years are not the correct understanding. And so now I'm obliged to tell you who I think these kings of Media and Persian Persia really are and who the king of Greece and what these horns really do represent. And so now I'll undertake that obligation. In order to do that, I'm going to jump ahead to Daniel chapter 10 where Daniel had an run-in with yet another divine creature. And what he saw was a man clothed in linen and his hips girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like chrysolite and his face like the appearance of lightning and his eyes like fiery torches and his arms in the place of his feet were like the sight of burnished copper and the sound of his words was like it, the sound of a crowd. And so Daniel saw an incredible divine appearance, an angel, an angelic being. And this angelic being spoke with Daniel. And please notice what the 
angel reveals to Daniel. He tells Daniel that he has been fighting in opposition with the prince of the royal realm of Persia for 21 days. And so here we have an extremely powerful angelic creature fighting with the prince of the royal realm of Persia. And so who is this prince of the royal realm of Persia that's opposing this incredibly powerful angelic being? Is this a human prince? Or is this prince yet another angelic being who is perhaps not entirely benevolent? And the angel goes on to tell Daniel that Michael, one of the foremost princes, came to help him fight with this prince of the royal realm of Persia. And he says here, And I, for my part, remained there beside the kings of Persia. And so who is he talking about here? This is an enormously powerful angelic be being, speaking of princes and kings, and yet it becomes apparent that these kings and princes cannot be human if this angel is in opposition to them for 21 days and needs help from yet another angelic being, who is also called a prince. And so there are benevolent princes and also some which are obviously not benevolent if they're standing in opposition to these benevolent princes. And so what the angel is telling, explaining to Daniel, he's giving him a view of what's happening in the spiritual realm between spiritual creatures and the enormous conflict that, as humans, we are unable to see. And so this angelic being is helping Daniel to understand that there's more going on in the spiritual realm than we realize. This angelic divine being now goes on to tell Daniel the purpose of his visit with him. It says here, And I have come to cause you to discern what will befall your people in the final part of the days, because it is a vision for the days yet to come. And so, this angelic creature has already helped Daniel understand that there's more happening behind the scenes that we cannot see that he wants us to know about. And he goes on to explain to Daniel near the end of chapter 10, do you really know why I have come to you? And so this is a good question for us to consider as well. Do we really know why or what this angel or divine being is explaining to Daniel. Is he really talking about human kings and princes? Or is he talking, explaining to Daniel what is happening in the spiritual realm, uh, the conflicts and the consequences of those con conflicts on Daniel's people? And so this angel goes on to tell Daniel, and now I shall go back to fight with the prince of Persia. And so is this angel talking about fighting with the literal prince of Persia, with perhaps Cyrus? Or is he talking about another divine being who is not entirely benevolent? In fact, it might be a malicious divine being because here we have the angel saying that he must go back to fight with him. And also, 
with the Prince of Greece. And so this angelic being, the reason he has come to Daniel is to explain what's happening in the spiritual realm and that it will, is having an enormous effect on the outcome of things on the earth. And he also goes on to tell Daniel that this angelic being, Michael, is in fact the prince of you pe people. And so here we have a, an angelic spiritual creature who is working and even fighting on behalf of Daniel's people in the spiritual realm. And so, don't you think that's a nice thing for the divine being to do? To help Daniel understand that there's more happening behind the scenes than what he could perceive? Or that even as we ourselves living in the time of the end can also perceive that there is an enormous spiritual battle happening between divine and angelic creatures in the spiritual realm and it's having an effect on us right now. If this, what this angel explains to Daniel helps us living during this time of the end understand what's really happening, then yes, we. I believe that we then really know why this angel came to see Daniel. So now if we go further ahead to chapter 11, the same angelic creature says that, that he stood up as a strengthener and a, as a fortress to Darius the Mede. And so now he is talking about a human king that this angelic being assisted. And now he goes on to tell him there will yet be three more kings standing up for Persia and a fourth one. And so is he talking now about human kings or is he talking about angelic divine beings? He also mentions that there will be a conflict against the kingdom of Greece. And so is this the literal kingdom of Greece or is this a spiritual representation of the kingdom of Greece? And so now, so now if we go into Daniel chapter 11 and read through the entire thing, we'll see a conflict being described which could either be a human conflict as most Christians seem to believe or what this angel is describing to Daniel is what's happening in the spiritual realm behind the scenes and the consequences that occur to Daniel's people and if this is in regard to the end of the days to Christians the consequences to us of these battles in the spiritual realm. Think very carefully about this. Now there may be, in fact, I'm certain there will be people who are saying, no, it cannot be true. These, this, these scriptures are referring to uh, pagan kings in our history books. And yet, if you believe that, then perhaps we should take a look at Daniel chapter 12, where it does indeed describe the same kind of thing happening during the time of the end in the spiritual realm and its effect on the earth. And here it says, war broke out in heaven. So it's no longer a battle or angelic creatures standing in opposition to each other. It's now described as a war. And notice that Michael and his angels, perhaps the same angel that, uh, one of the same angels that spoke to Daniel is included in 
his angels. Michael and his angels battled with the dragon, Satan. And the dragon and its angels battled. So here we're hearing about an enormous war amongst divine creatures, some benevolent and some malicious. And notice the effect. The great dragon was hurled. Satan, who is misleading the entire inhabited earth, he was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurl hurled down with him. So are these his angels, the same princes of Persia and the kings of Greece that we read about in Daniel? So now it does go on to say that the result of this battle is indeed a consequence for the earth. The things happening in heaven have consequence for the earth. Woe to for the earth and for the sea because the devil has come down to you, having great anger, knowing he has a short period of time. So here we have an enormously malicious and very powerful divine creature who is going to have an effect on the earth. And so the concept described right here in Revelation is that in my opinion, is exactly the same as what is being described to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 8, 10, 11, and 12. Think very carefully about this. But now we could also go to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll get a little more insight on to what is happening in the spiritual realm. Notice in Revelation chapter 2 that Jesus Christ is addressing the angel of the congregation of Ephesus. And so here we have an angel, an angelic creature, who has accountability for the congregation of Ephesus. And so Jesus Christ has accountability for Christianity, and yet that accountability goes through the spiritual realm to a congregation who is just a small entity of the entire Christendom. And so we can extend what Daniel is being told in chapter 8 right to this statement that Jesus Christ makes to the angel. Having said that, now I'd like to draw your attention to what the Apostle Paul said to the Ephesians, those same Ephesians, who have an angel over them, remember? A benevolent angel who perhaps has problems with other spiritual creatures who are trying to undermine him. And if we go to verse 11, it says here, or Paul says here, Put on the complete suit of armor from God that you may be able to stand firm against the machinations of the devil. And so here the fight is against a spiritual creature. It says here, because we have a wrestling or a fight, not against blood and flesh, not against human beings, but against the governments, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness against the wicked spirit forces in the heavenly places. So now it's my conviction that what Daniel is hearing from this angelic creature and from Gabriel in Daniel chapter 8 is a description of what is happening in the heavenly places 
through this wrestling with wicked spirit forces. And so it's not just the devil, it's against these authorities. And so these authorities would include princes and kings who are divine creatures and are not benevolent. So I'd like my audience to think carefully about what's really happening here or what's really being explained in the Bible and take another look at Daniel chapter 8 because from this new perspective a lot of what Daniel is being told has nothing to do with pagan kings or anything that we can find in a history book in any library anywhere and so I'd like to take a fresh approach with Daniel chapter 8 and tell you how I think it can be interpreted in such a way that it could be beneficial for a Christian living in the last days more beneficial than just a mundane history lesson. So before we go back to Daniel chapter 8, please remember that the battle is against the world rulers of this darkness, wicked spirit forces. So these world rulers, what do you call a world ruler? or a ruler in this world, we call them kings or princes. And so when we see the word king or princes used in the book of Daniel, we have to wonder whether a pagan king or perhaps a wicked spirit force world ruler is being referred to. So now let's go back to Daniel chapter 8 and look at the ram and the he-goat because that's really all we're left with now to help us see what's happening during this time of the end. So if we are now determined that these kings of Media and Persia and the king of Greece are not pagan human kings, then how do we go about determining who that ram is and what the horns are that stands for the kings of Media and Persia and who that he goat and the horns of that he goat are who stand for the king of Greece. Now remember that it mentions a final king will stand up a king fierce in countenance and that this is what will happen at the end of the days and we see here that it's against the prince of princes he will stand up so this is Jesus Christ this last horn is standing up against Christianity and it mentions it once again in regard to the small horn that grew that it was this small horn that put on airs against the prince of the army removed the constant feature and put in place the disgusting thing and the established place of his sanctuary Jesus Christ's sanctuary his temple was thrown down these are things that happen at the end. So if this small horn describes what will happen to Christianity at the very end, then what does the ram stand for? In my opinion, if the small horn of the he goat that grew is the end of 
the world in regards to Christianity, then the ram that Daniel saw in the vision must therefore represent the start of Christianity. I hope you understand why that rationale works and why there really is no other alternative if we understand that these kings are not human kings. They are spirit creatures. Understanding that, then we need to ask our, ourselves if there was an early Christian organization which had no wild beasts which could stand before it, no one was doing any delivering out of its hand, and it did according to its will, and it put on great airs. Was there an early Christian organization which had this much power in the world? And I think a reasonable person will realize that, yes, there was indeed. And that organization was called Catholicism. And so, in regards to Catholicism, how many different kinds of Catholicism were there? Well, I think we can agree that there were two. And yet, one was taller than the other. And so, what two kinds of Catholicism existed in the very early days of Christianity? Well, there was Roman Catholicism and also Orthodox Catholicism. And so there was indeed a very early start to Christianity where that Christian organization did indeed do according to its will and put on great airs and had great influence on the entire world. So what happened next? What about this male of the goats, which came into close touch with the ram and showed bitterness towards it and proceeded to strike down the ram and to break its two horns and that this ram was no longer able to stand before it. Well, if my audience asks themselves what happened to Christianity after Catholicism, then the obvious answer is Protestantism. And so this he-goat, the male of the goats, could indeed or must indeed represent the next iteration of Christianity, which if you study Martin Luther, is indeed Protestantism. And Protestantism itself put on great airs to an extreme and grew very much. So now the next question is what happened to Protestantism? And if we read in Daniel's vision, we'll see that the great horn was broken, and there proceeded to come up conspicuously four instead of it. And if my audience is following along, they should be asking themselves, what happened to Protestantism? Well, it reformed. And into how many different parts did Protestantism reform into? Well, essentially, four different sects of Protestantism reformed. And it, in fact, removed the great power and the mightiness of the entire Protestant religion and fractured the, this power. And so these essentially four different movements within Protestant 
baptism uh, should probably be further studied. And so if we go to Wikipedia on Protestantism and we look at what the general consensus is regarding Protestantism, we'll see that here we have movements within Protestantism described on a timeline. And so prior to this, Protestantism was one a very powerful religion. And yet we can see even today people agree that there's essentially four different movements within Protestantism. Number one, the Anabaptists. Number two, the Presbyterians. Number three, the Lutherans. And number four, Anglicanism. And we can see that from Anglicanism, we also get Methodists and Adventists. And so Wikipedia itself agrees by consensus that Protestantism, or the movements, the essential movements within Protestantism, are divided into four. Now, in regard to all these different churches in Protestantism, I'd like to bring your attention back to the idea that each of these churches, and then further on down, each of the congregations of these churches, likely have as a spiritual representative a benevolent angel who has been appointed to take care of this entire Christian organization. And yet, remember also, there are wicked spirit creatures who will attempt to undermine all of this. And eventually, that will lead to a time where that small horn mentioned in Daniel will come out of one of these horns. And so now we have a dilemma where we need to determine a small religion that comes out of Protestantism, one of these lines, and yet with a small start eventually grew to be quite large. Now back to Daniel chapter 8 for some more insight on to what happens at the end. Well, we have a, a king, fierce in countenance, who is represented by that small horn, and he will actually bring mighty ones to ruin, and also the people made up of the holy ones. These are Christians. Especially if this scripture has anything to do with the Prince of Princes, Jesus Christ. This King Fierce in Countenance will actually tend, contend with the Prince of Princes, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so this King Fierce in Countenance must truly be a very powerful king who undermines that final Christian religion that had a very small start and yet grew very large. So now would be a good time to look at other Bible scriptures that might support this idea that this king fierce in countenance is a very wicked spirit creature who undermines the final iteration of Christianity in the last days. And so I'll now go to another Bible scripture in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians, and we'll go to chapter 2, and we'll see that this is where the Apostle Paul describes what Christianity would be like at the very end. 
and immediately before the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him. So is there any indication of a wicked spirit creature's influence on this very final iteration of Christianity? Well, we have a man of lawlessness and a son of destruction, and we do indeed have the temple of God being profaned by this man of lawlessness and son of destruction who is in opposition to Jesus Christ and lifts himself up over everyone who is called God. And this happens in the temple of God, the sanctuary that Jesus Christ inaugurated with his crucifixion and resurrection. And so is there any indication here of spirit creatures undermining this final iteration of Christianity? Yes, there is. It explains here that the lawless one's presence is according to the operation of Satan with every powerful work and lying signs and portents. So here we have that final very fierce king or the king of fierce countenance a countenance is a face who undermines that very last iteration of Christianity so now if we go back to Daniel chapter 8 we'll find once again that place where this king is given that description a king fierce in countenance and remember that a countenance is a face so it's a king with a fierce face and is there anywhere in the Bible a uh, fierce face is described during the end of the world yes there is if we go to Revelation and chapter 12 we will indeed find that fierce face so let's go to chapter 12 and we, if we look at the end of chapter 12 we'll see what happens during the time of the end where it describes a woman who has the two wings of a great eagle and she flies into the wilderness to her place. So imagine if you're before this king of fierce countenance in a religion that's been totally undermined. You would probably want to get away from that king of fierce countenance. And you'll see here where it describes what happens to this woman who represents that entity described at the start of Revelation chapter 12 a woman arrayed with the sun and the moon was beneath her feet and on her head was a crown of 12 stars the 12 tribes of Israel and here we see that this woman gets away from what? the face of the serpent Satan's face and so remember in Daniel chapter 8 it described the king of fierce countenance and so can you imagine what the face of the serpent looks like a fierce countenance now back to Daniel 8 and if you remember this small horn the one which the angel interprets as being ruled by that king of fierce countenance comes out of one of them so out of one of what it came out of one of these four conspicuous horns and we've already agreed that these four are movements within Protestantism 
So now let's go back to that timeline in Wikipedia. And if we're talking about the very last iteration of Christianity or organization, Christian organization, then it must come from one of these four movements within Protestantism, one of the four horns. And so if we look at our recent history, has there been any new Christian religion which came from a very small beginning and yet grew out of one of these four horns. In my opinion, one of the largest and most prevalent iterations of Christianity and the most recent ones is Jehovah's Witnesses. They have grown to over 7 million and they are around the entire world preaching in at least 230 lands and approximately 500 languages. And their publications are published in more languages than any other publishing company does, including secular publishing companies and mainstream media outlets. And so if we ask ourselves, how did Jehovah's Witnesses start? Did it have a small beginning? The answer is yes. And this happened a little over a hundred years ago. And this small beginning started out of the Adventists. And this is through this horn, which Wikipedia calls Anglicanism. And so now what I would like to do is insert a video made by the Watchtower Corporation or the Watchtower Society called Faith in Action and it describes that very small start that Jehovah's Witnesses had. So listen carefully. In 1869, something happened that would help reestablish his faith. Seemingly by accident one evening, I dropped into a dusty, dingy hall to see if the handful who met there had anything more sensible to offer than the creeds of the great churches. Let us take note of the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus himself, to the apostles. In the there for the first time, I heard something of the views of Second Adventists from the preacher, Mr. Jonas Wendell. And he said unto them, Though his scripture exposition was not entirely clear, it was sufficient under God to reestablish my wavering faith in the divine inspiration of the Bible. Now remember, at this point, Russell is not an atheist, but he's just discouraged. He doesn't feel that truth can be found anywhere. And that sermon by a second Adventist was enough to get him to get his well-worn Bible off the shelf and to start digging. So now back to Daniel chapter 8. And if we look at the way... Daniel's vision was interpreted by the angel, we'll find out that this king, fierce in countenance, is responsible for bringing many to ruin. And against the prince of princes, he will stand up, but it will be without hand that he will be broken. And so now is there any time during the time of the end that we can see this happen? 
Well, let's go to the book of Revelation, a revelation to John about what would happen in those last days, the Lord's day. And we'll find in Revelation chapter 17 that there is indeed a battle against Jesus Christ. These will battle with the Lamb, but because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Lamb will conquer them. And so, do you see the parallels to Daniel chapter 8? Now, also remember that this wild beast does indeed bring many to ruin, as described in Daniel chapter 8. And if we move ahead to Revelation chapter 19, we will find that there is many people being brought to ruin in regard to this wild beast. In verse 20, it says, And the wild beast was caught, and along with it the false prophet that performed in front of it the signs with which he misled those who received the mark of the wild beast, and who render worship to its image. While still alive, they were hurled into the fiery lake that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed off with the long sword of the one seated on the horse. And so, yes, Revelation chapter 19 shows that there will indeed be many who are brought to ruin by this wild beast but I'd like to bring to your attention that it's the false prophet that performed in front of it the signs with which he misled those who received the mark of the wild beast. And Jesus Christ made it very clear that the false prophet would come in his name. The false prophet is therefore Christian. And the people who receive the mark of the wild beast and who are misled by this false prophet must therefore also be Christians. Because a person who is not a Christian would not follow the true Jesus Christ, let alone a false prophet that comes in his name. So it's only Christians that have to be concerned about being brought to ruin by this king of fierce countenance in the final part of the days. So now if my audience has understood this presentation, they're probably wondering where they could go next to find more information about this. And I suggest that you go to my YouTube channel, Isaiah 30 V8, and you could watch the video featured on the channel page, Jehovah's Witnesses Desolated. And this video was in 10 parts. It'll take about an hour to watch all 10 parts. However, if you're interested in that wild beast of revelation, then you could also watch uh, some recent videos I made regarding the wild beast of revelation and the image of the first wild beast in Revelation. Because if this is indeed the final iteration of Christianity which is split into a wild beast and an image of that same wild beast, then these videos will help you understand how Jehovah's Witnesses fulfill in quite an amazing way these scriptures. Now also if uh, you want to do some further research you can go to the link in my channel page on the left hand side and you'll find my blog and on my blog you have access to some more videos and also a book which you can either get in hard copy by clicking this link but there will be a charge for this it's a print-on-demand publishing company or you could read the book through by clicking on this link at the bottom of the sidebar in my blog. And this will take you to Script D, where you can freely read an electronic copy and download it to your own computer, if you wish. And so with 
this I'll conclude the video and later on we'll speak more about the constant feature or the daily sacrifice and will hopefully overturn what most Christians believe that is but unfortunately I believe very many people will be tormented when they begin to realize what that constant feature that is taken away from the Prince of the Army really is. And so with this I'll finish uh, a very long video and it was necessarily long uh, because the convictions that Christianity has today are so very strong that I believe that uh, a lot of detail is required in, over, in order to overturn those age-old convictions and to give Christians an opportunity to see what Daniel's prophecy is actually fulfilling in the final part of the days and that it is being understood just as prophesied by Daniel himself or through Daniel's prophecy himself that in the last days those having insight would understand and yet the wicked would not understand these things and so with that I'll finish this video thank you for what being patient with my uh, long-winded explanations and pers persevering to the end